going to get started. We have today the privilege of hosting a seminar uh, by uh, Professor Ian Glenn, uh, from, uh, who is uh, the Professor of Media Studies and Director of the Center uh, for uh, the Studies of Media and Film at the University of Cape Town, which uh, has been over the years considerably one at the top university in the African continent, uh, with whatever notwithstanding. Um, and he uh, is uh, here uh, as a continuation of the dialogue we started a year ago. Um, one of the most many publications, um, my preferred one is uh, uh, Media, Politics, and Power in South Africa. Uh, and um, I must say that when um, last year we, we, I had one of the most interesting intellectual experiences I, I, I had had in a long time uh, when uh, he invited me and, and Mati Fijola uh, to uh, lunch on seminar, long seminar, with uh, the faculty and graduate students of the Department of Media Studies at the University of Cape Town. And that was a fascinating discussion, um, really on the cutting edge of communication and, and network analysis and, and, uh, and new technologies of communication. But the most interesting thing is that uh, not only was it interesting, but it resonated entirely with the kind of discussion we have at the animal school. Uh, uh, point by point, um, everything we were talking here is the thing with the Victoria and uh, on which the, the, the faculty, in particular the young faculty, which is a very young faculty, he is the patriarch of that department, uh, and he is young. Uh, so, um, but uh, that, that was really interesting, and, and then from there uh, came the idea that one day we should really uh, continue the dialogue, not only. Uh, ourselves, but, but also bring in uh, the Hanover community into that dialogue. So uh, I'm happy that finally he could make this, and uh, we are here today to listen to what he has to say, and also to engage in, in, in the, the broader issue for redefining the relationship between politics, identity, and media in South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Do you mind if I stand here? Um, thank you, man. And thank you, Emma, for looking after me so nicely. Thank you, Brian, for helping the technology work. At least I hope it's going to work. So we'll have a look. Uh, I suppose in any good rhetoric thing, you start with establishing character. And I wanted to play you something because I thought it would explain what happened to me as an impressionable first year university student. Let me just click on this. I heard a speech by an American chancellor. Vice Chancellor, mm. Professor Robertson, <laughs> the Diamond, the Daniel, <coughs> and the ladies and gentlemen. I'm here right. this evening because of my deep interest and affection for a land settled by the Dutch in the mid 17th century, then taken over by the British and at last independent. A land in which the native inhabitants were at first subdued, but relations with whom remain a problem to this day. A land which defined itself on a hostile frontier. A land which obtained rich natural resources through the energetic application of modern technology. A land which was once the importer of slaves, and now I'm going to struggle to wipe out the last traces of that form of bondage. I refer, of course, to the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that was Bobby Kennedy at the University of Cape Town in 1966. Uh, so you will see that uh, the, the sort of parallel between the United States and South Africa has a long uh, history, a long kind of uh, interest to most South Africans, I think, are politically aware, and of course, a lot of interest for uh, scholars, a variety of people we could mention. Uh, George Jackson, Soledad brother, complaining bitterly about what he saw as the parallels between these two systems. 
Uh, Jam could see dustbins drunk to turn out with the two American trained uh, graduate students back in our department. Uh, if you read Dustlands, you'll see once again this uh, Vietnam War is a strong influence on how South Africans saw the United States. Uh, you see PJ O'Rourke, Holidays in Hell, a very funny section where he comes to look at the Fort Checker Monument, goes there to snigger and says, oh my goodness, it's the covered wagons, it's the people with the long rifles, it's us, uh, and looks at that with some dismay. And I think what's interesting about Kennedy's speech is he's speaking to an almost exclusively white audience, and he really very much has what Kipling calls the white man's burden. What are we going to do about this problem? We who are restoring the rights. And of course, in South Africa, we live now in what we call the liberated South Africa, a very different system. And of course, the emphasis, and I think some of my own work, has been on the complex attitude towards the United States among our South African leaders now, people like Nelson Mandela and uh, Trevor Manuel, uh, the kind of amb ambiguities, the ambivalences, particularly triggered by the Iraq war and what people saw as American motives. So we, we live in an interesting time, and I think the, the richness and the complexities of the parallels are something which any uh, South African is interested in. Uh, we consume enormous amounts of American media, but we're also interested in other things. My own personal trajectory, I came to the University of Pennsylvania to do a PhD on 20th century American literature, and taught my first teaching assignment at the University of Cape Town, John Coutinho, uh, who, of course, eventually won the Nobel Prize, went to and did the, we taught a 19th century American literature course. And my own work has, in fact, gone back even earlier to the history of nature media. What, how do we represent nature? And strong parallels and links between how that happened in discovering of, of the United States and the discovering of Africa in the 18th century. And the other parallels, we both have liberal constitutions and in fact, in a very quite conservative country in many ways. So they, I think they're fascinating parallels, and you know, one of the hopes would be that we'd get to explore some of those. What about media images of South Africa? I'm teaching a course at the moment on the Soccer World Cup and the media surrounding that, and one of the most interesting things we've found, uh, and I have quite a few American students in the course, we have a lot of semester study abroad students, in fact, the New York Times coverage has been very balanced, and the country that's bought the most tickets is the United States. And people are saying, why does it happen? Well, if you look at the coverage in Germany and the United Kingdom, we've had much more negative coverage. We have a nice little case of media effect. And you say, British coverage negative? Let me give you an example. <laughs> OK, that's after the Tablaj murder. OK, so it could be even worse. Wayne, Wayne Rooney machete. OK, match look at the machete. So you can see the kind of pretty dramatic, uh, hysterical coverage is not a race war breaking out your day, chance of being hit by a machete are rather kind of negligible. Uh, and I think it is seeing this kind of hysterical coverage, it makes one count one's blessings. To, to look back at the achievements of South Africa with all the qualifications, we have a liberal constitution. We have a democratic institutions and a free press. We have changed through the electoral system and party votes. Uh, the electoral system, we've had Natal, which in 1994 nearly uh, torpedoed the whole negotiations. The last elections, almost without notice, without fanfare, the ANC won, the, the Encarta Freedom Party gave way. In the Western Cape, the ANC lost, the Democratic Alliance came into power. And that was accepted, and there wasn't really a fuss, there weren't threats of violence. So in many ways, those democratic habits and uh, expectations have become imbued. And I think those, those are not uh, achievements to be neglected. And the other thing is, having been in the United States, I don't know how to say it without offending anybody, but in South Africa we have a smart, patriotic white right wing. General Constant Fulhuin for Matt emerges, I think, as a real statesman, someone who brought the white right wing on board into the party electoral system. And I think that that is also an achievement not to be neglected. If you look back 20 years, the fears of many people would have been that we're going to have a bloodbath. We have a heavily armed, uh, sort of heavily racist white right wing. That threat has really never significantly emerged. And I think that's an achievement also not to be forgotten. Afrikaners, for the most part, have accepted change. Uh, and I think that's also a surprise for people. Uh, when you see, for example, how in Holland now you're getting a very conservative right wing in the UK, elsewhere in the world, uh, Afrikaners have accepted change, and they've accepted rapid class change. Whatever the complaints about uh, black poverty, we've had huge improvements in a lot of black South Africans, largely thanks to an ANC economic policy that saw steady growth over a period of years. We've had rapid class change, the number of black students going to tertiary education, the number of black students who've got elect uh, black families that have got electricity or moved into decent housing. There has been a massive achievement in terms of class change, and of course with all the unsettling things that go with that. Uh, 
I'm going to cover a few, I suppose, most of the obvious, some of the obvious things, the press freedom. Do we trust our media? I'm going to talk briefly about new media technologies and their effect, knowing that there are people in the room who are far more expert than I on that. I'm going to talk about media and a new South African identity, and about segmented realities, because I think that is important. And I also want to talk about the presidents. We don't, I think, in South Africa, pay enough attention to the fact that Presidents have a start. I think in US politics that would be accepted, but in South Africa I don't think we've really thought about that enough. And I'm going to try and lure you or lure the interest of some of you by talking about research traditions and research resources. I think South Africa has amazing research resources and I'm hoping some of you will want to take the one. Of those. Monday's talk I think was very, sort of made me change or think again about some of the things I was going to talk about. We do have a free press, and that does build democracy. And there's a great quote by Melville when I was teaching that 19th century American course. One of the great quotes, I think, is, uh, when you have that, you, you do have hope for the future. The future is the Bible of the free. I think it's one of the great optimistic quotes of the American 19th century. Well, do South Africans use media? And I think we have a fascinating parallel. We, that media freedom isn't an empty freedom. It reaches people. It reaches the bulk of South Africans. We have quite, I think, 90% of people who listen to radio. Radio, and I think several people here have said it's a really important medium, huge reach, uh, and that's largely SABC, often in indigenous languages, a heavy television use. And they're a fascinating phenomenon. You'll see there 67% of the people are reading newspapers just about the time of the election. And then there's a kind of apathy after the election. We're fed up with politics. We don't really want to know about it. We've got the new South Africa. We don't really need to have that. The, the, Average engagement, South Africans are not that political. It's strange enough, one of the things that we found out, South Africans, after the election, we want to get on with our lives, we've got it, we've had the miracle, we don't need to follow that anymore. And we see this quite sharp drop off in following uh, sort of coverage of all the people reading newspapers, and only now picking up again after 2004, the rise of the black tabloids like the, the Daily Sun. So quite an interesting thing that uh, daily use through uh, television and, and radio heavy sustained over the period, but newspaper use dropping and then picking up again. So I think that's quite interesting as well. Press freedom. We've got a vigorous independent press. And one of the interesting things, even though press ownership or press control has passed to often into black hands, into the hands of the kind of new black companies, we've got a vigorously, often antagonistic black press, most dramatized by uh, the Minister of Health, the Sunday Times with a huge headline, which I couldn't find, otherwise I would have had it, Manto, a drunk and a thief. I mean, that, that's your Minister of Health, uh, that's your kind of headline. That's kind of snappy. That got people's attention. A uh, huge outrage in the ANC, of course, but the Sunday Times had the story showed it, and uh, the, uh, the minister had a, a liver transplant because uh, she'd been chronically alcoholic, and this was one of, one of the things that was shown. We have strong investigative television programs. The arms deal coverage, the coverage of an arms deal, the kickbacks to the ANC, one of the moments of great disillusionment for the ANC, where the ANC moved from being, if you like, the media darlings to being seen as just another political party, both within the party and by the media. We really got quite strong coverage. And I want to talk a little bit about Zapiro versus Zuma. <coughs> Z versus Z, or Z versus Z. Okay. Zapiro is a cartoonist, trained in the United States in part, uh, liberal, very hostile to uh, apartheid, and uh, someone who, in fact, has covered, you can see whose side he's on. He's clearly, in a sense, liberal. Uh, kind of might not go down well in America with a Middle East and middle name, but I've seen very much of a kind of pro Obama. Okay. Got a sharp pen. Okay, the next one apparently caused some consternation in the State Department. This was 2001. Colin Powell refused to come to the anti-racism conference in Durban, uh, so he's now portrayed as Uncle Tom, uh, you know, with George Bush telling him what to do. Kind of the slave bell there uh, hasn't. It's a, a shock, of course, it's sort of shock. So you can see Zapiro's got a sharp pen, sharp commentary. Colin Powell's refusing to go to Durban with the American non-governmental organisations. Uh, so kind of tough pen. Now. This is one of the things that led to lawsuits. At the time of the Jacob Zuma rape trial, every day outside court you had these protesters. And of course you see Zuma would go out and the song is Bring Me My Machine Gun. It's a struggle song, very controversial. And of course you see the machine gun is not shooting out uh, uh, bullets, it's shooting out little uh, you know, sperm for Zuma's sort of sex urges getting portrayed. One of the things, Lady Justice looks on horrified at what she sees as this interference. <laughs> Very controversial. One of the big things 
the rape of Lady Justice, the, the ANC youth league, Julius Malema, you uh, have Mantashe, the head of uh, the ANC, the head of the South African Communist Party of Kusatu, sort of gang rape of justice, Zuma being encouraged to go, but very controversial thing. It really has offended people, uh, offended the ANC in lawsuit. This, I, ironically, I think is the thing, if Zuma's lawsuit comes successfully, will be the one that uh, he gets uh, gets damages for because I think he didn't purge himself and of course it suggests he did. Mr. Zuma raised two fingers to be sworn in. And now you can see that Zapiro is not backing down. And Zapiro is a hugely influential figure, named journalist of the year. He's not just an arbitrary uh, uh, cartoonist, he's a central figure in how we see things. Uh, so you see he doesn't back down at all. Uh, I'm suing for damage to my reputation and then Zapiro sort of self-portrait. Would that be your reputation as a disgraced, chauvinistic demagogue who can't control his sexual urges and who thinks the shower prevents AIDS? So he's not exactly backing down and apologizing and minimizing the effect. Okay. And then Zuma panic. <laughs> Uh, Zuma Simpson becomes president. You see the little thing there, cartoonist jail, the sort of rather grim view of oh, this is what's going to happen. Of course, nothing like that's happened. Sapiro carries on. We have uh, the president. So maybe slightly alarmist, the view of what would happen under the new presidency. So that's it. Now, the interesting thing is, do we trust our media? This is an interesting finding because you might say, well, and this I'm, I've stolen a lot of Bob Mattis slides. Bob Mattis is probably the top academic pollster in the country, political policy, runs Afrobarometer. We've just done a, an entry together for the oh. new SAGE handbook on political communication, on political communication in the new South Africa. This was fun because we disagreed about lots of things, but I learned a lot of doing this. And I think one of the interesting things is there's a difference between the elite discourse and the larger view. And I think the other thing is Stan Greenberg has written a very interesting book on working as an advisor. He's a very interesting section on working with Nelson Mandela and Mbeki. And he comments on the sophistication of South African voters. They're not to be fooled. Uh, trust the public. Trust your voters. Your voters are smart. Now, one of the really interesting things, and this surprised me, that is from Bob Matter's work, the trust in your news media. That's the SABC, the state broadcaster. It drops about 2002, but it's very high, 70%, 63%. I don't know what the comparative... The U.S. figures are, that's a high figure. Your private broadcaster, ETV, goes up. It's just overtaken the SABC, which is you know, perhaps worrying for the SABC. But compared to the police, parliament, the courts, our media enjoy a very high level of trust. So I think, once again, we see that constitutive element of democracy that the media actually are doing very well. Higher than courts, higher than parliament, higher than aren't. The police are widely regarded as uh, still corrupt and uh, taking bribes and so on. But that's positive. Heavy media engagement and quite heavy trust in the media. And then, well, Why are the newspapers so low, though? I mean, you've got ABC and TV, SABC, but the newspapers are way down at the bottom. Yeah. I think it would be interesting. Uh, uh, that's a good question. Whether that's a uh, partisanship or something, I've uh, passed. I'm going to pass on that one. I think it's a very shrewd question. I think your black voters would tend to regard a lot of the white, largely white newspapers as a suspect. They seem perhaps as more ideological. I think also some of that would be tabloids. And the tabloids would be regarded perhaps with some suspicion. But I haven't got a better answer than that. Okay. So one of the things I think is that to talk about the state broadcaster, because I'm sure many of you uh, have a suspicion of state broadcasting, well-founded, how in countries like France or in many places in Africa, the state broadcaster becomes a voice of his master's voice, a voice for the uh, dominant party of the day. I think what's happened in South Africa is a far more nuanced and a far more interesting thing. The big issue to me is the state broadcaster gets a tiny percentage of its revenue from the state and from television licenses. The bulk of its revenue, something like 85%, has to come from advertising. So, in Eliu Katz's famous phrase about segmentation, deliver us from segmentation, the state broadcasters had to segment its television channels and segment television news. So I, as an English-speaking white South African, do not get the same news from SABC TV as a closer speaking viewer does, or a Sutu speaker view viewer does, or an Afrikaans viewer does. So one of the worrying things is we're not getting the same news so the whole issue of news and the public sphere is a really complex one. Because although we have a state broadcast and a public broadcaster, you've got a kind of balkanized news service. Although they're sharing resources, we're not getting the same news. And I think that's a really interesting question, and I don't think that's ever really been seen in another state broadcaster. So we have, a, I think, a really interesting state organization. <laughs>
The manual of the Rubia I feel on thin ice. And Emerson said when on thin ice, the vices skate fast. So if I skate fast over this section, you'll know it's because I feel that I'm really not uh, the expert here. Fascinating work, though. Let me just highlight some of the things that I think are really interesting. The digital divide and cell phones. I think we get a story which is contradictory or tension. One of my uh, students uh, was the uh, moderator and the editor of the country's biggest citizen journalism website. She did a thesis on that experience. And her sense was, if you like, still fairly pessimistic, that on the internet, to those that have shall be given, that the educational and financial advantages of particularly white South Africans <coughs> translated into them having, if you like, a more aggressive web presence, uh, being more exclusive, uh, that in fact you had a higher access, and that the realm didn't really function as a realm of uh, the public sphere uh, and that it could ideally have done, because it was still dominated by, if you like, the wealthy, uh, better educated minority. At the same time, we had work done by another of our graduate students, Tino Kreutzer, finding this amazing uh, phenomenon from townships where young black kids, up to the rate of 75% of them, were using the internet through their cell phones. So the question is, well, what kind of internet access is it? It's through something called Mixit, which is a very cheap way to get on the internet. Uh, what kind of richness of experience is there? But South Africa has the third highest or the fourth highest rate in the world of people going onto the internet via cell phones. So we have this very heavy bridging of the digital divide through cell phone usage. How satisfactory is it? What kind of experiences are there? That's the kind of thing we're doing more and more work on. Uh, we have links with people like Microsoft, uh, local television uh, providers, local cell phone providers. That, that's, I think, some of the most interesting work that we're going to carry uh, on doing. I just wanted to point also to some political usages of the internet. When Jacob Zuma was really looking down and out, when he was on trial for the rape trial, he'd been thrown out as the ANC, uh, as the vice president of the country, and he really looked like a dead man walking. The Friends of Jacob Zuma website was set up, and I think it became a strong rallying point. <coughs> People would send in SMSs. People would download some stuff. I think a lot of civil servants who were secretly sympathetic would access the site at work. So you had this site as a kind of rallying point, a virtual rallying point. No other medium was available to Zuma. Not internet, not radio, none of the state media. This then became a kind of rallying point for a person, a politician in disgrace. And no one's really looked at this. I think it's a really interesting site. We have the fact that we have a president who communicated largely through the internet. The ANC Today website was a place where Tabo Mbeki communicated at great length, often very controversial. So I think, well, once again, the ANC flirted with the idea of having its own newspaper, <coughs> settled eventually for the ANC Today website. Really interesting thing, if you might say, well, Jacob Zuma doesn't find media space. If you're a white, you put this slightly racist, well, where do you go? If you're white and you're very really unhappy about what's going in the country, this is not something you can say publicly, either it's embarrassing, or else it's something which, in fact, uh, you're not going to find space for in public media might to some extent in talk radio, and I'm going to come back to talk radio, but expatriate websites be have become a site for white anger. Uh, often, look at what's happened. Look at what the crime rate is. So a lot of the websites are expressing uh, discontent, dismay at what's happening in the New South Africa. Now, we have, how strong can national identity be in the New South Africa? We come from this apartheid state. We have 11 official languages. We have a strong policy of affirmative action, which is resented, obviously. We've got resentment and disillusionment, high rate of violent protest. We've got a high rate of white immigration. So what do we expect that national identity would be? Well, I think we have staggeringly high figures. How many people say they're proud to be South African? The rate is 90, over 90%. How many people say being South African is an important part of the self? Over 80%. How many people want their children to be South African? Our figures for all these are high. So there is a strong buy-in to the notion of being South African, seeing that as a key part of your identity, seeing that you want your children to be South African. How many people think it's desirable to create a united South African nation over time? Even white South Africans, you can see an increase from 58% in that shortly after uh, coming up. That figure goes up and up. So in other words, while the black figures come down to some extent, I think in general you see a, a strong sense of a kind of desirability of national unity, of moving towards uh, a nationhood, not sort of moving towards a new apartheid of any kind. And I think Bob Manners' conclusion is uh, quite interesting. This is from the paper and research he's done. Uh, 
We've got a near consensual agreement among citizens that the legally defined political community is the appropriate one, that they are indeed members of that community and that they are proud of that membership. And I think that's an achievement that's not to be uh, kind of dismissed. I think that is a signal achievement. It's thanks to a lot of things. I think media played a role. I want to talk a little bit more about that. Did media help? Well, once again, the comparison with the United States, I think, is very interesting. If we by some surprise had the democratic alliance in power tomorrow, what policies would change? Well, affirmative action policies would change very little else would. I think, would foreign policy change? Would economic policy change? No, very little else. In other words, we've got policies where they cope, uh, the democratic alliance or the ANC were in power tomorrow, it would be very difficult, I think, to say what exactly would be the policies that would change except around issues of affirmative action and how aggressively that were to be pursued. The argument of the Democratic Alliance is we have a corrupt group of people in government, not the policies on X or Y are particularly wrong. What is B? BEE, sorry, Black Economic Empowerment. Sorry, it's, a, it's a, the uh, sort of South African slang or South African jargon for affirmative action. In other words, uh, for, in terms of government contracts and so on. Uh, is there another American phrase besides affirmative action? It would be tendering processes that give preference to uh, black firms or black companies. I think we've had an acceptance of democratic public change in the media. The media pushed this, if you like, fairly relentlessly. I think the other fascinating comparison, I don't know if anyone here works on talk radio in the United States, where the assumption is talk radio is a right-wing space. I think maybe, maybe a right-wing analytic. But talk, talk radio in South Africa, I think, has had a very positive educating force. I think it is a place where white South Africans or people who are unhappy about things vent, but the role of the moderator is always to remind people of the achievement, of the other side of the uh, coin. People phone and complain, and say, but you have to remember, if you were on the wrong side of apartheid, how would you feel? Or on the other hand, a black South African phones and the person says, well, what do you think on the other side? So the, the role of the moderator in talk radio, I think, has quite a different role from America, where, if you like, it seems that there's an amplifying effect. Why is that the case? Why should it be the case? I think that would be quite an interesting comparative project. Sport. Sport is a huge builder of national identity, perhaps because for us, the most important sporting events are sporting events played against other nations. So in other words, it's not us against Cleveland or us against another team or another region. That matters. But the key events are if we beat the Australians, we all walk around with a beam on our faces. Uh, if it's not quite as important, maybe in some terms as Barcelona or even Milan, <coughs> but these things matter. Okay, so the question of how we see sport. And of course, that national moment of national identity is absolutely crucial. Advertising has been a huge force in nation building. Our commercial, our, our people who do advertising are really strong on this. From before apartheid, I call this beer page, I want to play you a clip. South African brewers have been very interesting. They got into trouble with the apartheid government because they showed people of different races drinking beer together before the end of apartheid. And the government was trying to stop them, saying, you can't do this. And they said, what are we doing? I want to play you a clip. Okay. Uh, very good. <laughs> so the quality is not great, but you'll get the idea. He's got a kind of South African rugby jersey on. South African footwear as well, you'll see. who are taking gap years, who are thinking of leaving. So the strong patriotic pull, if you look at the comments on YouTube, for example, you see the kind of the, the, the effect that had, the sort of nostalgia. But once again, you see the very deliberate attempt to do nation building through drinking beer. Okay, 
you, bright place, beer, you know, watch rugby, you can see the kind of sporting thing, you'll have that replicated time and again. And I have to say, if anybody understands the way black consumers in South Africa are thinking it's South African brewery, they've investigated it more than any political party, any academic, anybody. So it's quite interesting. Their ads are very finely tuned, I think, to the kind of appeal or the kind of issues that are concerning you. One of my interests is the role of the satirist in politics. So if you go back to the history of satire, you'll see in old battles, the satirist was one of the kind of key people in your army. He'd be at the front hurling insults at the enemy. Now, sometimes I think American politics, boy, that's rather similar. You know, the kind of satirist out the front yelling rude things about the opponent. Uh, I think South Africa, we've got a rather different thing. Sorry, you can see I did a PhD in English, so forgive me. Okay. Uh, if you look at the English 18th century, you see a phenomenon where satire comes in after you've had civil war. Catholics and Protestants killing each other on matters of doctrine. What does the satirist do? The satirist says, let's find the sensible common ground in the middle. Let us make fun of the extremes. Let us, on the one hand, the papists do that and the mad Protestants do that. Let us find a common, ideologically kind of more neutral ground. And I think that's far closer to what we have in South Africa. That we don't have the satirist as the person who, if you like, encourages the extreme, but the satirist is the person who stands on the middle ground. And it's very interesting, after the most recent uh, murder of Eugene to Blanche and Malema at the same time stoking the fires and singing, kill the farmer, kill the poor, the reaction of newspapers was not to take one side or the other, but to say, chill, you know, chill, cool down. Uh, let's look at this. We don't want that extreme. We don't want that extreme. So in other words, uh, whether it's a satirist like Peter Dirk Ace, whether it's newspapers, I think that the, the, the <coughs> idea that we have to find a common ground or a central space uh, which allows difference, which doesn't engage <coughs> politics, but which is far more important for us. So perhaps because the threat seems far more real of going to one extreme or the other, the notion of finding that middle ground is something important. Editorials and coverage war against extremes. We have got segmented realities. There are real problems. Uh, we've got elite Afro-pessimism. Uh, Blood Diamond, I think, catches some of that quite well. The, uh, Leonard DiCaprio figure, this is Africa, that kind of disillusionment, which I think is spread through from journalism into literature, into film. Uh, crime is a big issue. Uh, I think the whole issue of how we see crime in South Africa. <clears throat> Another fascinating issue, and I think this is going to be a key uh, difference down the road, the number of younger women, uh, young black and uh, colored women in tertiary education is something like 40% higher than men. So I think the reality, the gender tension in South Africa is going to get bigger. I think what that means in terms of uh, new identities is something which is really an intriguing issue. The importance of the president. The president in South Africa has a huge structural role. The ANC will ask you to vote for provincial, or for, for, would be, it would be the American equivalent would be the Republicans would be asking you to vote for the governor of California without saying who that person's going to be. The president is all powerful. You don't actually get a say. The ANC will then determine in due course. So we have a hugely important, this, the, 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 all the figures about uh, representation during elections, <coughs> the president, the leader of the party takes more and more importance. So the style of the president, I think, is very important. Mandela, uh, many of you may have seen Invictus, that moment where Mandela comes onto the, uh, the rugby field in the Springbok jersey, uh, Diane and Katz talk about media events, they talk about media events having a shamanistic possibility. I think that's actually the best example ever. That shamanistic possibility, Mandela transforms himself into the, the enemy, the white figure. For white South Africans, it was a collective gasp. Mandela is wearing a Springbok rugby jersey. Nothing was ever quite the same after that. So it's a wonderful example of that media event. And I think, of course, the film tries to go back to that and capture that. Mbeki, and maybe we have questions about that. Uh, my comment would be that Mbeki, I think, is really interesting. In one way, the, the you know, <coughs> presence of huge approval ratings, as recently as 2006, higher than Mandela ever got, 77% positive ratings. In many ways, a highly admired president, and yet fatally flawed because of the denialism about AIDS, and I would say the denialism about crime. And in many ways, I think Mbeki is the example. Where else have you had a sort of postmodern sociologist as head of a state? I think there's a really interesting question to be asked about his belief system, his kind of uncertainty about uh, HIV AIDS, where one would really want to look and say, to what extent is this uh, 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 an example of his upbringing? I hope I get someone, I'm trading my coat, I hope I'll get some take up on that. 
But Clancy, I think, was interesting. We forget we had this placeholder president of Iceland, the Gerald Ford of South Africa. You know, he threw out one president, and there he was for a few. But in a way, what was good was the country didn't fall to pieces. We had this new guy as president, and the world went on, and then a new president was elected. So maybe that was also reassuring in terms of the kind of maturity of our democracy, that we could carry on in spite of that. And of course, Zuma, most interesting thing very recently, Zuma proclaims cultural diversity that he represents Zulu values. The latest poll shows black South Africans actually disapprove quite strongly of the polygamy, of the illegitimate child. His approval ratings have dropped quite sharply among black South Africans. So I think there's a really interesting question to what extent uh, this really is widely accepted. One of my young colleagues is Zulu, and I was teasing him and saying, boy, what is it in the water and the towel? And he was very indignant and said, look, Tuli, you know, won the Nobel Prize. He only had one wife. Uh, Butelezi only has one wife. This is not Zulu value. So there's a kind of, and I think that's quite widely replicated that a lot of people actually feel very uneasy about this. Strong Christian, uh, Af sort of strong Christian traditions among a lot of black South Africans. So uh, not widely, not fully accepted. Okay. This is a word from our sponsor, so to speak. Okay, <laughs> research. Um, South Africa has had, I would say, a very long uh, and I think very sophisticated and quite reliable research tradition. Uh, all the advertisers in the country put 1% of their budget towards something called uh, that, sorry, what happened there? Okay, sorry. Um, all the advertisers have to put 1% of their budget to uh, Advertisers put 1% of their budget to a research foundation, which is run independently, which uses people like Nielsen. So your apps figures are figure on media usage and on consumption. So you have really sophisticated figures. So you have ARs, television, uh, radio uh, ratings. I think there's a lot of material, and it's been there over time. Millwood Brown do what I want to do some comparisons on. They have recorded in a pretty reliable way how well people like new television ads from the time of the New South Africa. So you've got every new television ad has got ratings by racial and other groups. So how well did people like humor? How well did people like the use of children in ads? How well do we like animated ads? I always thought that could be actually a fascinating social graph, particularly because of the importance of advertising in trying to create national identity and trying to build multiracialism. So that would be perhaps an interesting thing. How well does an ad play in the United States compared to the way it played in South Africa? Because often we have uh, similar ads. We have a lot of good academic work. Bob Mattis, of whom I spoke, runs Afrobarometer. We've got household poverty surveys. We've got a whole database of UCT called Data First. So I think there are there's a lot of data that we're not using enough. Media Tenor South Africa are another commercial organization. They have a branch in the United States, by the White House apparently sometimes. Uh, they have branches in Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Namibia elsewhere. But Media Tenor have for 10 years been covering all news media in South Africa. Well, almost all the major newspapers, all the television news. So, for example, if I want to do research on how the Zulu <coughs> television news shows things differently from the Afrikaans television news, Media Tenor can give me that in a pretty handy way. And they've got all the things recorded. So that, I think, is an amazing resource as well. And for any kind of content analysis, how often do the South African media cover HIV AIDS or cover uh, rural poverty or water supplies, you can get a pretty good picture very quickly. So I think that is an amazing resource and kind of comparative exercise is something that should be exploited a lot more. I think we are small. Uh, someone here said that this, they had a smallish school or a small apartment. I wanted to, I was half tempted to, to kind of collapse hysterically with laughter, but also kind of envy because this is huge compared to our, our department. This is a very large and, and well endowed department. But I think that the London School of Economics one, which is a very small department, which does a lot of collaborative work, is perhaps realistic for us. We have to collaborate. I collaborate with political scientists, scientists to write. Uh, I collaborate with a sports scientist, um, something on sports scandals. So there are lots of things that we work on with people uh, in other departments. Uh, but I think what's lacking, I think, is international comparative research. I think that's going to try and, try and push us into the big league, and of course, that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm going to stop. Okay, we have. <laughs>
some time for a conversation. Thank you very much for a really fascinating uh, talk. Uh, lots of food for thought for those of us in the U.S. I wonder if I could um, push you a little bit more on the slide that you had about presidents. Um, where does Tutu fit into all of this? Because it seems to me that what, in some ways, the, the uniqueness of Mandela and even going into Mbeki's first few years was the, the, this strong shadowing of Tutu as a religious figure, but also as a public figure. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more. I think Tutu has been one of the voices of conscience and often highly resented by the ANC because he's spoken out against uh, corruption, he's spoken out against uh, Zuma. You know, he's, so, so in other words, Tutu is someone who is resented, as he was resented by the old apartheid regime, of course, when he spoke out as a voice of conscience. I think he's one of our, the great South African figures. But he's, you know, and Tutu has even at some point come close to saying, well, you know, do we vote ANC, which is almost taken as, as for granted. So he, he's a, a complex figure, and I think obviously rhetorically a very interesting figure, but certainly not seen by the ANC as a friendly or a positive figure, and often sharp attacks on him resent, uh, resentment, as in fact there was against Mandela. You know, Mandela came to, when, when the Mbeki government was in, the Mbeki cabinet was really uh, hostile to HIV AIDS, Mandela came to uh, you know, uh, speak at a, a, a meeting, and it's one of the things that was really resented against or held against in Becky afterwards. And Mandela was treated very shabbily, you know, really treated as this old man who didn't really understand these complicated things, and uh, pushed aside more or less. And, and that was used really as a sort of stick with which to beat in Becky afterwards that he'd allowed Mandela to be treated like that. So the old, you know, the old sort of uh, voices of, of uh, conscience and reason in the party, and I think or, you know, in the country, which were really Mandela and Tutu have got this complex relationship with younger people. I don't know if that really answers your question. <coughs> you had a slide about um, South Africa um, and the, how important it was for their identity to be South African or for the children to be South African. I was curious, um, because there's so many different languages and so many different groups and histories, do you know any numbers or anything about other identities, regional? Uh, well, was, the question was really was, you know, do you identify yourself first as a Zulu, an Afrikaner, an English-speaking South African, or a South African? And, and the, the, the choice was very much, do you identify yourself as a South African? And I mean, so, some of Bob Maddis' work, and we couldn't talk about that, couldn't talk about that enough, was people don't want to vote for a party which is seen as a separatist or a particularist party. They don't want to vote for a party which is just for the Sutu. In other words, a party which is not seen as inclusive has you know, a lot of bad things for it. One of the great achievements of the ANC, of course, has been to be the inclusive party, a broad church which includes people and you know, pushes ethnic uh, identity aside as the most important identity. So it's been a huge modernizing force in South Africa. And I think that's really, it's that legacy which everyone shared. And one of the big problems for the, the Democratic Alliance, it's still seen as a largely white opposition party. And for that reason, for a lot of people, it doesn't look like a home where they'd be that welcome in. So until the DA can become, if you like, a black party or a, a, a seen as a sort of really multi-ethnic uh, or multi-racial party in the way that it isn't at the moment, I think they're going to struggle. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Do you also know, like, how that came to be, how it came to... Well, I think, you know, one of the things I suppose I was trying to say is media have worked on it. I mean, it's not just, you know, it doesn't just happen that the message that you've had from Mandela, from everyone else, has been a message of inclusiveness of a new national identity. And, you know, it's coming through advertising, it's coming through a lot of things. And I suppose one of the things, you know, looking at a very divisive political situation in the United States in many ways is to think, well, how come you have so much more in common and have had so much longer traditions? How come ideological fractiousness seems to be <coughs> caught on here, whereas it would have seemed much easier for that to catch on in South Africa? Okay. It's, that might be a really naive analysis, but... <coughs> Thank you. A question really based on ignorance. Um, you know, about the rural urban breakdown. Uh, both in terms of numbers and in terms of political power, because in, in many countries, you know, sort of the population is increasingly urban. Mm -hmm. But in, in many countries as well, this one included, the rural, less populated areas, for historical reasons, have disproportionate political power. Mm -hmm. 
there are things I should have explained that in the talk would have been a sort of PhD seminar for a long time. Two of the things which I think are really interesting comparatively, and, and uh, first of all, there is no local representation. You know, in other words, you don't vote for a congressman. You vote, you get a proportional vote, and then the political party that gets 10% of the, the uh, people will appoint those 10%. And it's one of the weaknesses of the system that we don't have a congressman or a congresswoman for a particular region to whom you don't complain about potholes or whatever. So that, that, that's the sort of increasing centralization of power. So I think that's one real problem. Uh, so th there isn't really a rural area that gets attention. And one of the big problems and the, the reason for the huge number of, of violent protests, uh, as, as people uh, in, in poorer areas just feel they've been abandoned by local councillors, they, they're not getting, uh, their voices aren't being heard. Uh, so I don't think that there's a disproportion, there's a disproportion almost disempowerment of those areas. They offer media map, the SABC is not covering them adequately. So I think those are real problems. The other really interesting thing, and I think it's a very mixed blessing or mixed picture in a way, is we don't have local television news. You know, and this is one of the, the, the really interesting things that would be worth exploring against the conventional American wisdom that you know, uh, television news drives up fears of crime and so on. In South Africa, we've had almost the opposite, almost downplaying of the country of, of crime. There are 50 murders a day, and you know, it's a much higher rate than in the United States. But because there's not local television news, perhaps the portrayal of things is very different. Now, on the one hand, if you had local television news, you would have covered perhaps rural issues or, or small town issues in a way you don't at present. On the other hand, maybe it's been a good thing in that it hasn't <coughs> fueled this kind of hyper-awareness of crime. So it's, so it's really the opposite of, of disproportionate political powers? I would say, particularly because your rural, you know, there the, are the two issues, sorry if I just carry on for one second. It's the white farmers are, you know, see themselves as uh, very th threatened. Uh, there's this uh, concern, and it's become one of the factoids in the world, is the most dangerous occupation in the world is being a white farmer in South Africa. A lot of them have been killed. But the fact is, there's a huge murder rate in any case. Most murders in South Africa are black on black. So, you know, it's not, uh, it's a violent country. There's big, uh, huge poverty levels. Uh, you know, violent crime is, is a fact of life. Uh, so white farmers would say they're not getting adequate treatment, adequate coverage, but they are compared to others. But it's the real rural black poverty that I think is the really uh, sort of uncovered issue. And of course, there's a lot of migration to the city. Waiting another particular question. The, the gender thing you were talking about, which was very interesting, and then Carl's question reminded me of Winnie Mandela, who's a, a figure of some sort of curious role, and I'm wondering, you know, where she is now. You know, that, that is, that's sort of a trial. They're making a movie of her, so I wait for the movie. Uh, uh, the movie raised fascinating issues. I mean, for anyone who's got interest in intellectual property, there is a sort of paradox. Winnie Mandela got very shirty. She sort of went to the movie makers and said, you can't just copy everything I've said. You know, when you think about it, she has a point. You know, you can't do uh, ABBA and copy their songs and, you know, why should you be able to copy someone's speeches? So the, I sort of had an interesting moment of thinking sort of sympathetically for Winnie Mandela. The really, interesting, <laughs> the really interesting thing about Winnie Mandela was that she denounced Nelson Mandela recently and it was a speech picked up by... Um, uh, V.S. Nightfall's wife, and then she denied she made the statement, so there's a whole controversy. But what's interesting is what she said, because I think that is actually behind the scenes, what is being said about Mandela, that he sold out to the capitalists and that there's a you know, sort of a love of money in the leading class. And I think that's the voice that really, if you like, is in some ways driving Malem with his $40,000 breaking watch. You might say, how can you even talk like that? But there is this sense of a kind of demagoguery of you know, how the ANC leaders have sold out. And that might become a, a more important uh, sort of voice in, in the country. I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, I, like I wonder if you would uh, go a little bit further in terms of the a very interesting statement that the moderators on the media tend to come bring things back to the middle as opposed to those on radio here which amplify uh, that. That's a very intriguing statement. Is it across all the media? Uh, how did you, where do you think that came from? How do you get the moderators to the <laughs> Where can, can we create some moderators? <laughs> well, you know, it's partly because you're not going to hire people who, we've had a few controversial figures. Uh, Janie Allen, uh, you know, was a sort of right-wing Shock, shock, yes, if you that's a kind of shared phrase, but uh, she, she, and she didn't last very long. The, the voice of 
uh, there's an interesting phenomenon as well that often those figures are colored, I mean, in, in the South African terms. So, you know, they, they moderate in racial terms between white and black. So I think that's also interesting. Often that they're seen as the figure who can be a figure somehow centrally in, in, in the country. But politically, I think what's interesting is the typical thing would be you'll get a white viewer phoning or white listener phoning in and complaining about something. And then the moderator will say, yes, but. Uh, and then the next person will phone in and give the other point of view. So they, they, they do attempt to do a balance. And whether that's part of the station's policy or just part of a, a sense of their civic responsibility, uh, we could interview people, we could ask them about it. But you know, I, I occasionally appear as an expert person on talk radio. It's always interesting in those terms also what the relation between you as an expert person and the, the radio host is. So I think that they, it, it, you know, one would want to do, one of my colleagues in fact is working on talk radio and, and the, the issues around that. But I really think that could be an interesting, I mean, I think your, yours is the million dollar question, what happened? Is it station policy? Is it orders given to people? Is it that uh, people have just seen it more responsible? But also the question would be why in America do the amplifiers work? Is it that you really, uh, you, know, you know. If you're not black or white, you know, in terms of your views in America, uh, nobody listens to you, you're just milk toast. But why? That's, that's the really interest. Maybe the, the research that has to be done is on America. <laughs> I was wondering if you would predict the media work uh, for the World Cup this summer. Where, what will do you think will be the trajectory of South Africa becomes a world focus? Or a, a space? That's what the seminar we try to look at and think about. <laughs> One of the interesting things, which I don't know that anyone else has ever really found this, and maybe people who've worked in other countries have found it, but a lot of South African self-image is mediated through what foreigners say about us. Mm -hmm. uh, that's this kind of strange phenomenon. I call it the tri third man theory, or sort of triangulation theory. In other words, you know, it's only when the LA Times or the New York Times or the BBC says something that we really take it seriously. I mean, the, 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 a good case in point is crime coverage. South African journals were carrying on and about crime. The BBC came into the story, you know, Becky immediately reacted very, very early. How can you say this? So there is a sense in which what the other person or the third person view about us, what that is that we take more seriously. Partly, I suppose, because tourism, tourism is important, but there's a, it's a bigger issue almost. It's a question of, you know, do American media really care what the rest of the world says about what they're doing in Iraq? Probably much less because there's maybe a, a much bigger sense of self-sufficiency. But in South Africa, what foreigners say matters. So I think what's interesting about the World Cup is a mix of concern about what FIFA does, huge resentment about what FIFA does. So that's a, one of the tensions. And I think because we've always had this strong relationship with England, I'll be a cynic and say a lot of the coverage will depend on how well England does. If England does well, suddenly yeah. we'll be doing we'll be well. And then the United States, you're playing each other, of course, early on. But if um, England and America do well and Germany do well, I suddenly suspect we'll become flavor of the month. Uh, if Venezuela, I don't know, you know, and, and no, Korea win, uh, then I think we, we'll probably find, you know, that we, we very portrayed negatively. It's a cynical view. But one's view of sports and sports success spills over, I suppose, is one of the trivial observations I'd make. What's your sense of South Africa's relationships to its, uh, its neighboring countries, particularly Zimbabwe? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I found out, I mean, when I did this research on how the SABC different channels covered and the, the research was on coverage of Zimbabwe, was a shock to me because white South Africans were getting a pretty negative, cool view of Zimbabwe. Black South Africans were getting a far more positive view. You know, so one of the, the issues that we're finding, of course, is Zimbabwe, you know, Mugabe comes to South Africa, comes to a big international meeting, all the black South Africans stand up and applaud, and the rest, you know, white South Africans and the rest of the world looks on and says, what's going on? If you'd watched the media, it made perfect sense. So I think that there's White South Africans in particular, but not only white South Africans, see what happens in Zimbabwe as really a, you know, a horror story. Farms have become unproductive, it's a country that can't feed itself or it have the potential to be the breadbasket of Africa. A lot of concerns about that. A lot of black South Africans look at it, Malema being the case in point, who went there recently, see it as the example to follow. We should be more aggressive in pursuing land claims and so on, sort of vindicating this or heralding this as some kind of triumph. So Zimbabwe is very much a sort of litmus test in how people see, uh, you know, orient themselves politically. Uh, but I think the, the most South Africans, I mean, there's huge xenophobia. I mean, the, one of the big targets of xenophobic violence was Zimbabweans. There's a huge influx of Zimbabweans uh, from exile into South Africa. So it's a very, I, I can't give you a quick answer, I'm afraid. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Again, um, I want to come back to the question of, of identity that was raised earlier. Um, I, I, I get in the descent of the data you, you presented, but how much uh, really can we think about the a superseding of the identities, the strong identities. But for instance, uh, clearly the Sulu identity, uh, Suma believes that this is a strong Sulu identity and practice that. Uh, don't, there's no connection with the Hosha identity and, and the fact that, that Mbeki was Hosha. And, and is that didn't play a role in terms of, in terms of the appointments to, to the government. Uh, other than the, the, the color and, and, the, and the whites. The Kosha had a much greater part than the Sulu fell. Uh, the Kosha and Austria, as we call and, it. And, okay. in and in Kata, it still was, you know, uh, there are reverberations in Kata, although in Kata was, uh, the, the Sulu party was, was uh, manipulated by the whites, but still, uh, because at least in my impression and, and, and the discussion in academia, and, but also in the society, the, the question of different identities that do not contradict uh, necessarily the South African identity, but that construct the identity. And just related to that one, one additional thing, language is one dimension, but not necessarily the most important one, because for me, one of the most striking things about South Africa is that in, in the Western Cape, most of the African speaking people are black. You know, the black Africaners. Uh, or brown Africans as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and color. So, so it, this is it's a mixture of things. In, in other words, one thing is that, yes, the South African national identity has been created, and this is a great success story. But on the other hand, how the, the, the politics of identity plays out. But I think one thing we could say, it's there to be exploited. But, you know, in Carter tried to exploit it and it didn't work. And one of the things you've got to say about Zuma was he made peace with the, uh, you know, he made peace with that. One of the interesting observations about Mbeki and Mbeki's weakness when it came, you know, when it came right down to the showdown with, uh, with Zuma was Mbeki was mistrusted even in the Eastern Cape because a lot of the traditional course have found it easier to relate to Zuma because he'd come and drink beer with them at the kraal and things like that. Whereas Mbeki very deliberately avoided going to the Eastern Cape because he didn't want to be seen as a course of partisan because he, he portrayed himself very much as his super modern, you know, above regional or ethnic identity. So one of the arguments was, well, he should have played that more. It's a card that can be played. What the effect will be, I'm not, you know, I don't think anyone really knows. Uh, certainly in the elections, it's clear that Zuma and the ANC lost support in every other region of the country except in KwaZulu-Natal. So there, the Zulu identity certainly helped him. But, you know, the NEC, the National Executive Committee of the ANC, which is really the key it's the high Soviet, I suppose. They got rid of Mbeki when they turn, and I think the fear of Zuma is if they turn against him, what will happen? That's not ethnically dominated by a certain group. It's voted on by the whole ANC. You can't just have a Zulu faction or a Corsa faction in that grouping. So I think, you know, the politics of the NEC would be resolutely more anti-ethnic, but it's certainly a factor, and you might find a separatist group that tries to exploit it. But as I said earlier, Bob Mattis figures on people don't want an exclusive party. If I set up a Corsa only party people would tend to, to go away from it. The PAC, for example, which is mm. black identity, has done very badly. So that, I don't know. I mean, I, you know. I'm sure you have evidence or, or no, counter examples, no, no, no. but I, 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 I would say this is a I um, am very interested in the digital divide. And of course, I guess the best case scenario is that there is no digital divide. But um, we're talking about Catherine Reese and bringing up some of the issues or the problems. If I hear so much about you know best case scenario, I wonder what worst case scenario is and what actually went through my mind when you first started mentioning hers. She's probably a mother who, like me, has to hide the laptop to get the kids out no. to play. No, she's a full time. No, she's a full time. She was running this website. Uh, it's, it's a professional website. It was an offshoot of the biggest sort of news thing in the country. So, not a mother that I know. No, she was she was a young young sort of recent graduate who got this job pretty young, and she was running the citizen journalism website. So the the dissertation was about her experience as a moderator, in fact. So the issue of moderation comes back into it. And, you know, you'd say to people, we don't want, you know, hate speech is forbidden and we don't want flaming, we don't want uh, certain things. And it was her experience of what happened on the website. And I suppose my, my, my view at the end of the thesis was I think she underestimated the success of the website because although I, I, the phenomenon that interests me, I suppose, is 
you complain yourself into something. You know, you, you complain about being a South African in the in the in the, the, the most famous expatriate website. But what happened with all this complaining was you realized only the other people in the site who were South Africans understood your complaints. So in in, in, a, in a strange way, you know, at the end of your complaint, you felt more South African than more linked to South Africa, and more positive about South Africa than before. And I think the same thing tended to happen on her website. The more you sort of complain or, or raise these racial issues, the more at the end of the day you could have shrugged and said, oh, that's normal. Of course, someone else is going to say that. So people got into, this response is predictable, therefore we're going to avoid that predictable response by saying that. So I think more was happening in terms of, you know, the harbour massy and rational public sphere being created out of this, uh, you know, opposition that, that happened between extremes. And once again, you know, your extreme oppositions tended to push people onto a middle ground. Now, you know, the question is, why go for the milk and toast middle ground? I think that is one of the key research questions that I will take home with me. You know, <laughs> why is it milk and toast? Why is it not the rational sort of strong space? Yeah. Right. Well, thank you. I think it's a wonderful presentation, and I, and I hope that this is the beginning of a ongoing conversation. Beautiful. Beginning of a beautiful conversation. Thank you.